Hello, and welcome to the 1980s. More specifically, welcome to the Wild West that is computers and software in the 1980s. It was a time of great experimentation, rapid growth, and an absolutely horrific amount of copyright infringement. Sega, Atari, Nintendo, Commodore, Apple, and Microsoft were all in the game, and that's just to name a select few. By 1984, only about 8% of American households had a computer, but it was a growing market. Of course, with every growing market comes an influx of those hungry to ride the wave. One of those companies who just so happened to find themselves really shredding that metaphorical wave was a California-based game developer called Epix. Can you drop some bandages for me? <laughs> <laughs> no, Epix, who you probably remember best for the game series of, well, games. By 1983, just five years after the company opened its doors, Epix was the 16th most valuable software company in the world. However, only six years later, Epix was bankrupt, and by 1993, the company shut down entirely. Ten years from being at the top of the gaming world to disappearing entirely. This is the story of the rise and fall of Epix. As a lot of good things in life do, Epix got its start at a Dungeons & Dragons game. The game was run by Jim Connolly, and it became so large and so successful that he decided to buy a Commodore PET, the first personal computer available to the public when it was released in 1977. In addition to helping with the bookkeeping for what must have been one hell of a D&D game, Connolly wanted to use the Commodore to make some money and offset the $795 price tag. With an interest in programming since the 60s, Connolly decided to create a video game coded in BASIC and enlisted the help of John Freeman, a regular at his D&D game. Now, Freeman was no programmer, but what he did know were games and writing. He was a contributing writer to the hobby magazine Games, and had recently published a book about board games. Together, Connolly and Freeman had two halves to the video game development puzzle. Connolly handled the programming and built the game's basic system, while Freeman took care of the game design, which basically means he did everything else. Together, they finished a space-based war game called Starfleet Orion in 1978. To sell the game, the duo established the company Automated Simulations, so that people would have a name to put on checks, according to Freeman. The game was primitive by today's standards, but it was very well received and quickly put Automated Simulations on the map. The following year, Automated released Temple of Apshai, the first in their Dungeon Quest series, and the game that would truly serve as their breakthrough. The game was a massive success, both critically and financially. Even though home computers were still a relative rarity, Temple of Apshai sold over 20,000 copies and would be ported to various platforms over the following years. By 1981, however, Automated Simulations had grown stagnant. Their games were still running on the same engine that Connolly had developed in BASIC back in 1978. With games like Ultima and Wizardry now becoming immensely popular, Temple of Apshai and its 11, yes 11, sequels were beginning to fall to the wayside. Freeman had grown frustrated with Connolly's resistance to updating their technology and left to form Freefall Games with his wife and Westfall. Now, Connolly was left alone to run the 30-man company from their Sunnyvale, California office. He began to rely heavily on venture capital and outside investors to keep afloat as their sales continued to decline. Desperate to bring automated simulations back to its glory days, Connolly hired marketing specialist Robert Botch to help revive the company. Botch quickly became wary of the dated and complicated Dungeon Quest series and chose instead to focus his efforts on marketing the more action-oriented Jumpman. Now, Jumpman will look very familiar to anyone who has ever played the original Donkey Kong arcade games, but hey. It's what the people wanted, and it quickly got people's attention. Investors took notice, and veteran businessman Michael Katz was brought in to run the company alongside Connolly. Katz had come from the company Coleco Industries, where he was behind the release of the ColecoVision console, which had been a massive success the previous year. It didn't take long for Connolly to get the sense that Automated Simulations was no longer his company, and in 1983, Connolly left with his own small team of developers called the Connolly Group. They would release a few games through Automated before eventually fading away into the oblivion of the 1980s. So now, Katz and Botch were left to reinvigorate Automated all on their own, 
Their first step was to embrace a brand name that the company had been using on their more action-centric games for years, Epix. They then acquired developer Starpath, bringing an influx of young, talented developers into the company. The success of Jumpman on the Commodore 64 smoothed the transition into Epix's new image, and the release of Summer Games in 1984 cemented it. Summer Games was an incredible success, selling a quarter of a million copies by the end of the decade and propelling Epix to previously unreached heights. The company moved its headquarters to Redwood City, California, and would eventually peak at around 150 employees. This time, though, Epix would be able to sustain their success, thanks in large part to Summer Games 2, Winter Games, World Games, Impossible Mission, and the Pit Stop series. All were enormously successful and lauded for how effectively they utilized the audiovisual capabilities of the Commodore 64, the premier PC gaming platform of the era. In fact, many considered Epix to be the absolute masters of the platform, and this perhaps contributed to the feeling of unease the heads of Epix felt upon the release of California Games in 1987. Now, don't get me wrong, California Games was a smash hit, and is probably the game the company is best known for today. That wasn't the cause for concern. At this point, the developers at Epix had pushed the Commodore 64 as far as it would go. It would now be next to impossible for Epix to come up with new ways to impress gamers on the aging Commodore 64 platform. And that was an issue as well. The 64 was getting old, and it seemed only a matter of time before the industry left it behind and gamers followed suit. At that time, Commodore 64 versions of their games accounted for nearly 50% of Epix's monthly sales. It seemed that, for the second time in a decade, Epix would have to find a way to rebuild. Only this time, they would be ready before the decline. The first step in this preemptive measure was the hire of David Morse as CEO. David Morse had come over from Amiga, a company that had produced the revolutionary Lorraine chipset. Amiga had worked with Atari to potentially use the Lorraine system in an Atari console or computer, but after the video game crash of 1983 tanked Atari's value, which is a story all on its own, Amiga instead secured a deal with Commodore to produce what would be called the Amiga Computer, leaving Atari, who had recently been purchased by businessman Jack Tramiel, out to dry. Now, remember this, because it will be very important later. So Morse had a vision for the future of Epix, a handheld console. Now remember, we're still a couple of years away from the Game Boy, so Morse wasn't wrong. However, the creation of a brand new console, especially one meant to be small and mobile, isn't cheap. By the end of 1988, the Nintendo Entertainment System had essentially killed the Commodore 64 market. Many of their fellow American developers began publishing with Nintendo, but Morse insisted that games can be done better on the Commodore 64 than Nintendo. Epix held out hope for their handheld console and weathered the storm that Nintendo hath wrought upon the video game industry. By 1989, Epix was ready to reveal their handheld console, which they were calling the Epix Handy. However, an investment into the tens of millions into the device left Epix in a state of financial despair. Morse had successfully sold his revolutionary Amiga computer to Commodore before, and now it seemed he would have to do it again with the Handy. Unfortunately, this time, things wouldn't work out so well for Morse and Epix. Enter Jack Tramiel. Remember him? Notorious business shark and head of Atari? You know, that guy that David Morse and Amiga basically screwed over when they secured a deal with Commodore instead of Atari. By 1989, Atari was no longer the powerhouse they had once been, having been completely overshadowed by Nintendo and Sega. Tramiel sensed Epix's desperation and saw the Handy as an opportunity to put Atari back on top. Atari purchased the rights to the Handy and assumed all responsibilities for production, marketing, and distribution. Epix's only job was to produce games that would move the console come release time. The deal wasn't great for Epix. It meant they basically lost all control of their baby. But hey, at least they got the money they needed to stay afloat. The Handy would become the Atari Lynx and was released in September of 1989, just two months after the juggernaut known as the Nintendo Game Boy. Soon after, however, Atari cut Epix out of their deal completely on the grounds of a breach of contract. This meant that Atari now had full ownership of the Lynx. There are no clear answers to what exactly transpired between Atari and Epix to lead to this outcome. Was it pettiness on the part of Jack Tramiel, who may have been eager to punish someone who had burned him before? Or was it simply a shortcoming on the part of Epix? No legal documents have ever been found to support either scenario, but plenty of rumors seem to point both ways. 
Sadly, there wasn't much Epix could do other than grin and bear it, and, well, wait for those royalty checks to come from the games they had already developed for the Lynx. But those checks wouldn't count for enough, and by the end of 1989, Epix was bankrupt. They did eventually come out the other side of the bankruptcy and move to developing games for consoles rather than the PC market, but Epix would never come close to returning to its former glory, and by 1993, the company and its assets were sold off to a Christian company, Bridgestone Media Group. A British company called System 3 bought Epix's game library in 2008 and released revamped versions for modern consoles, but many titles will remain lost unless you're lucky enough to own a working Commodore 64. Fifteen years after Jim Connolly and John Freeman decided to make a little game called Starfleet Orion, Epix was dead. The company had evolved greatly over those years, but in the end, it was all born from the desire of one man to find a reason to write off his purchase of a computer on his taxes. It's fitting then that Epix disappeared just as unassumingly as it began. Hey guys, thanks for watching this episode of Nostalgia. If you enjoyed it, please let us know by liking, commenting, and subscribing to our channel. You can also follow us on all our social media down below in the description. If you'd like to hear more about the history of Epix, we discussed our thoughts and shared info that we couldn't fit into this video on a podcast. You can find that in the description below as well. Once again, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.